Hello, and welcome to Hobart Hall's broadcast studios at William Patterson University. I'm Loretta McLaughlin Binier, and joining me today is sociology professor Jennifer DeNoya, a dietary researcher whose new study on powerhouse fruits and vegetables is causing quite a stir since it was published by the CDC. Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So let's start off by defining what is a powerhouse fruit or vegetable? A powerhouse fruit or vegetable is a fruit or vegetable that's packed with nutrients that are beneficial in preventing chronic disease. Chronic diseases such as? Heart disease, cancer, leading causes of death. Okay. Why should we change from the four, group, the four food groups approach to define powerhouse foods to your approach? I think the four groups can be confusing for consumers. Mm -hmm. So not everyone knows what's a green leafy vegetable or a cruciferous vegetable. Um, so the idea is to move away from the grouping approach and focus on individual foods and the nutrients that they provide. Okay, fantastic. Um, so what is it about watercress that makes it the top powerhouse vegetable? Watercress makes it in the top because it has the largest concentrations of the different foods. Um, but the message isn't that we should only eat watercress. The message is to ma eat a variety of fruits and vegetables, a mixture of foods within the powerhouse group. The reason for the ranking scheme is so that we can have a sense of which foods have more, more nutrients than do others. And so they're listed, they're ranked that way so that you can see which ones are higher on the list and which ones are not. Okay. Um, so what are some of the other powerhouse foods that people should be adding to their diets? Well, there's 41 foods on the list, and I can't list them all for you, um, but certainly uh, people can take a look at the list. Atop the list are things like watercress, Chinese cabbage, um, beet greens, spinach. Those are some of the, those are some of the good vegetables. Um, in the fruits, there are things like um, lime, grapefruit, strawberry. Um, so there are some citrus food groups in there, yes. and there are some uh, berry groups. Uh, berry foods, um, it sounds like it's a pretty good variety of foods. Yes, the foods that were included for study came from those four groups that you mentioned before, and those are green leafy, cruciferous, citrus, and yellow orange. Okay. Um, why did you decide to conduct this study? I was really interested in helping consumers know which fruits and vegetables sort of pack the most wallop, if you will, in terms of the nutrients they provide. And I'm interested as sort of an educator in the idea of giving people uh, a list of foods where they can see which ones give you more nutrients for your calories. I see. So what data did you use to uh, conduct the study? The data came from the USDA. The USDA has a natural, uh, national nutrient database for standard reference. Okay. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, but basically, for any food, including fruits and vegetables, you can, it's a searchable database, and it will give you the nutrient breakdown for that food. Okay. Yeah. Um, some people are asking whether the scheme that you used is actually beneficial in a study because it doesn't include any phytochemical information. And, so and how it's do you a, respond it's to a that? Great, it's a great question. Um, when I started this study, I wanted to incorporate phytochemical data. But the trouble was that there aren't uniform data on phytochemicals, meaning if you read report A, it says this much, depending upon how it was measured. Mm -hmm. But if you read report B, it says that much. So when I say uniform, I mean a single database that has all of the phytochemicals that we could use in a score like this. Mm -hmm. So that was one part. But the other part is there aren't any dietary reference intakes for phytochemicals, meaning recommended amounts that are good for you. Okay. So it's hard to meaningfully put those data into a scheme like this without knowing what's a healthy amount, you know, what's more than a healthy amount, what's less than a healthy amount. So people could get too much of a good thing? I mean, I guess theoretically, without those thresholds, though, it's hard to say. And I guess part of the reason why the thresholds haven't been set is because we're still learning about the phytochemicals and how much of a good thing is a good thing. So uh, one of the other criticisms of the study is that uh, plants have a lot of vitamins, but they don't have a lot of vitamin B12. So why include them in this study? Why, why make them one of the key nutrients? It's a great question. The reason is I chose the nutrient list based on guidelines of the Institute of Medicine and the World Health Organization, and B12 is one of those. So the, these are nutrients of public health interest sort of writ large. So 
when I looked at B12, I thought about whether or not I should exclude it for the reason that you said. But there are some conflicting data. Some researchers find some trace amounts of B12 in such vegetables as broccoli and asparagus, and even in the National Nutrient Database. Um, B12 was listed in certain types of mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So I decided to err on the side of caution and leave it in the scheme. Okay. Um, well, this is a very complex study and people should really read about it, read it, uh, find out more about it. Um, but what is the essential message that you want our viewers to take away from this study? I think it's eat your fruits and vegetables, and I think it's choose wisely. Mm -hmm. I think foods on the list count, but foods that aren't on the list count too. But if, but if you know what the rankings are and you're picking something for dinner or for a side dish, and you say, well, I know this is a little more nutrient dense than that, and I, I can get more nutrients for my calories, then you might incorporate that into your meal. So it's useful as, I think, an educational tool and for people to kind of be savvy and to focus on the foods and what they can do for you. Well, I think that's a really important message for all of us to take away. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being with me today. Thank you. And thanks for joining us today at William Patterson University's Hobart Hall Broadcast Studios.